as a young man under authority and I've been instructed to do this. Uh, you helped me to welcome my father in the Lord, the hero of our day, the defender of faith, the father of fathers, the leaders of leaders to come and bless us this morning. Our father in the Lord, Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumuyi. Put your hand together for the Lord. You're welcome, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. God bless you. We well, thank the Lord for the session where in our GCK for June. And I pray we well, bless you. Glory to himself. Lift you up and make you the kind of minister that you ought to be. He has a purpose for you. Purpose for your calling. He has a purpose for bringing us all here. He has brought us here. That will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. That whatever he wants done in your life, he will accomplish, he will do. Please open your mouth and pray to the Lord. you pray. serious interference which we really observed before. Let me quickly rescan it and bring
In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this session, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your calling. Thank you, Lord, for the impartation in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the success you mean, your plan, your promise, and you are going to effect in every minister that has your calling. We're asking, oh Lord, that today you open our eyes to recover all that we have lost in ministry and your power will be magnified in every life in Jesus name you are the God that cannot fail you are the God that calls and equips and what you equip us for we're going to accomplish and do in our lives in our ministries in our calling in Jesus name we're asking, Lord, as you have the ministers of old and the servants of God of old, in the same way since you have not changed, the same as ever you will do in every life in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, we have committed our lives, we have committed everything we have unto you. And you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow and forever. We are asking, Lord, that you pick up everyone, a brother, a sister, every minister, and you will effect your plan, your will, in every life in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the ministers of God said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. As we begin our ministers and professional conference this morning, we want to have an introduction to the great things God has planned to do. These are the last days. And in these last days, it's going to repeat what he, what he did in the first century of the Christian church. And God will so empower us, energize us, equip us, that will go forth and preach the word, and it will have the same effect and the same outcome as the outcome and effect it had in the previous years. And I pray that you will make yourself available available to preach, available to minister, available to uh, serve the Lord, and the Lord will do through your ministry what he has never done before in your calling uh, in Jesus' name. Today, we, as we start, we're looking at recovering the lost axe head for life and ministry. Recovering the church, what we had before, the power we had before, the zeal we had before, and the passion that the church had before, that the church as a whole will recover that axe head that have been lost for our lives, the life of the church and the ministry. Now, the local church, your own church, what the church used to have, the power, the passion, the zeal, the effect, and the productivity your church used to have. Maybe you don't see it now like it has happened to some denominations that were fiery, that were powerful at the beginning. But now, as we're moving on, it appears the fire is no more there, the power is no more there, and the productivity is no more there. That's what we're talking about. We want to recover the lost axe head for our lives and for our ministry and now for the individual. You look at how many years you have been in the ministry. The Lord called you and you knew. And you knew the effect that he had on your life. Use your prayer power, your fire power, and your purpose, what you had at the beginning. When the Lord called you, when you started the evangelistic ministry, or the pastoral ministry, or the apostolic ministry, or the prophetic ministry, or any other area the Lord had called you to, you knew what you had and how the Spirit of God used to move you like he moved something. But now as we go on, after the years, the higher we go, 
the cola will be calm. And so the Lord is saying, the challenges of the day, they are more than what you even had in the past. And you want to now give yourself to the Lord and say, whatever I have lost of the power, whatever I have lost of the passion, whatever I have lost of the result of ministry, I want to recover that back. That's why I'm here. That's why you are here. That's why we are here. There'll be a recovery. There'll be a restoration of whatever we have lost. And then the Lord will even take you beyond the past and beyond what you lost in Jesus' name. Recovering the lost acts hedge for life and for ministry. We're looking at Second Kings and we're reading from chapter 6, verse 1. Second Kings chapter 6, reading from verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee, we dwell with thee. You'll see there was a companionship there. You'll see there was a united mind there. Elisha, a prophet, but their leader, their teacher. Elisha, the head of the school of the sons of the prophets, he stayed with them, he lived with them, and he said, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight, is too small, is too confined for us. And then in verse 2, he tells us in verse 2, let us go, we pray thee unto Jordan, and take hence every man a beam. Everyone was to be involved in the building, in the growth, in the expansion of the ministry that the Lord had called them to in the place, the habitation, not only their habitation, the habitation of God that the Lord himself has raised up. They said, let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he said, go ye. You wanted to do, that's good. You want to expand? You want to enlarge? You want to increase the habitation where you are and where you are learning so that more of the grace of God and more of the power of God will come upon you. He said, go ye. And then in verse 3, it says, And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. Yes, you might not be cutting wood, but just your presence there with us will be enough. Therefore, be pleased and be content that you will go with us. And he answered, I will go. I will go. As we lead the people of God, and they go forth, and this is what they want to do for the growth and the expansion and the increase of the work of the kingdom. The leader on top must not be sleeping at home. He must have in mind if the young generation, if they have the zeal, if they have the passion, if they have the desire, they were going to do whatever it will take so that they will expand, exchange, and grow the kingdom. The man at the top who had been there for a long time, the leader who is teaching the sons of the prophets, he too must have the willingness, he too must have the zeal and the, and the passion to go with them. I will go. Actually, it's that kind of decision in our hearts as leaders, that kind of decision in our mind as the leaders of the people of God, of the sons of the prophets, and of the people who are getting the work done, the decision to always be on the cutting edge that you are available, 
that the passion you two you used to have in working for God, in preaching the gospel, and uh, in the expansion of the kingdom, we must have uh, the desire, the decision, and uh, we must have the perseverance. I will go. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, so he went with them. Never make a promise you are not ready to fulfill. And never set your mind on something. I will do that. I will go. I will act. I will preach. I will pray. I will fast. I will. And then uh, where the robber meets the road, when the reality comes, then you have reasons to chicken out and to say, I thought I would don't be a leader that promises I will, that makes a decision I will, and then when the time comes, you cannot. But Elisha, he said, so he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they caught down wood. That's what he said you are going to do. If you have passion for something, and you say, I'm going to do this, and now the opportunity comes, and the privilege comes, don't change. Do what you said you will do. It is that consistency. It is that passion. It is that uh, a kind of sticking to the goal that is what makes us that will make you the man God has called you to be. And so when they came to Jordan, they caught down wood. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, but as one was cutting down, felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. The axe head fell into the water. If you, uh, if you know the, some people I know, they say activity is what matters. Duty is what matters. Even though the axe head has fallen into the water, into the river, they keep on cutting. They use the wood. They say it is not a fruitfulness that matters. It is faithfulness that matters. They are faithful. They keep on calling. I say, my brother, <laughs> look at the axe head. The axe head is gone. The axe head is no more there. The power that will get the tree down, the power that will make the ministry grow is no more there. Why don't you stop? No, I cannot stop. I've committed myself to faithfulness and I'm going to faithfully do what I'm supposed to do but it's not yielding results it's not bringing down any tree it's not convicting any sinner it's not converting anyone whatever I leave that in the hands of God God has planned and purposed that if you are going to cut the tree down you will have the axe head on that rod, on that wood. He does not use the sovereignty to cancel your own duty. And therefore, you must have the accept. But you know this, a uh, uh, son of the prophet, he was intelligent enough. And he cried. That is, he called out. He approached. He didn't approach another person who has lost his own axe head. He didn't approach another person who is just at par with him, a colleague. He approached the man who was their master, their leader, the representative of the Almighty God with them. And he said, Alas, master. He called him master. He called him leader. He called him the one that has connection with our master, the Messiah, our God, the mighty God of heaven that has connection with that mighty God. He said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. And then in verse 6, in verse 6, and the man of God, that's the master, that's the leader, the man of God said, where fell it? And he answered him, the, he showed him the place, and he caught down his stick 
and he cast it hither and the iron we did swim you know elijah he took off he took over from elijah and god led him when it when there was no good water in jericho the city is good but the water is not and it was causing disease and death he said show me the source and at the source they took a cruise of, of salt and put it in there and the whole thing was healed and now we have an axe head that is falling into the river and he said where, where, which part of the river where did it fall and they said it's here and they showed him and then he caught his stick and threw it through it there and the iron did swim and uh, in verse 7 in verse 7 he said therefore said he unto him unto the man that lost the axe head take it up to thee there's the divine part which you cannot do there is the powerful part which you cannot effect god can do that he does the supernatural and you do the natural it's a combination of the supreme God of heaven and the submissive servant here on earth. It's a combination of the divine to make the iron to swim and then the human part stretch forth your hand and pick it up. And he put out his hand and took it. That's the story we're looking at. It's good to understand the story. Then you understand the application. Recovering the lost at head for life and ministry. There are three parts we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at the life and the ministry of the man of God. We become children of God, sons of God, servants of God. And then we become the man of God. Of God. Number two, we're looking at the link with the miraculous through the ministration of the godly. Elisha was a godly man, man of God, godly and righteous and connected with God. And this man that had lost the axe head linked up with him. We need to link up with our master. That's the Lord Jesus Christ the Messiah and the one that's able to do all things perfectly in our lives. Number two then is the connection, the connection, the link with the miraculous through the ministration of the godly. Number three is learning for mastery. Learning for mastery. Have you seen Elisha? When he came to Elijah, not just uh, a plow, a person plowing uh, with the oxen. He didn't know anything about prayer, anything about supernatural power. He didn't know anything about miracles. He didn't know anything uh, about walking uh, and serving as a prophet. But when he came to Elijah, he observed Elijah. He learned from Elijah. Elijah and he learned until he had the mastery. Elijah was no more around. He'd been taken up by the chariot of fire. And now he was alone. But he had received the double portion of the Spirit of God as Elijah was going up to heaven. He had learned everything he ought to learn and now it was time for him to make use of what he learned when Elijah had gone. Learning for mastery. We learn so that we do not remain at the kindergarten of ministry. We do not remain at the foundation commencement of ministry, but we move on and we learn until we master the art of ministry. Learning for mastery by the ministers of the gospel. Let's look at number one. Number one is the life and ministry of the man of God. We've read the passage already. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, we're looking at life and ministry of the God. We're looking at uh, the conversion and the call of recoverers. The people that end up and they recover. They recover. 
recovered the loss. They recovered the loss in other people's lives. They recovered the loss in their personal lives. Number one, they have a conversion and they have the call to be the recoverers. Number two, is the commission and the consecration of restorers. The commission that God has given We recover the lost. We recover men. We recover women. We recover the people who have gone astray. And we recover the good, wonderful things the Lord has given that anyone has lost, any church has lost, and that we might have lost. We have the commission, and then we have commission, we have the consecration to back it up. The commission and the consecration of Restore us. Number three, is the conviction and confession of the recoverable, recoverable, the young man that approached the master, that approached the Lord through Elisha. He himself, he was recoverable, recoverable. He had a sorrow at last. My master, it was borrowed. He had, he had the passion, the desire that that which I have lost, I want to regain, I want to recover. He himself, his life, his ministry, his passion, and everything he ever dreamed of, he knew those things can be recovered. The recoverable, if we're going to have all these in our lives, we have to position ourselves that one, we recognize our laws. Two, we recognize the power higher than our power that will make everything we have lost come back into our lives. We become in short the recoverable and we'll have the conviction. I know that thing that was lost is not lost forever and i know that this that i'm seeking after by prayer by faith is not lost forever i have that conviction but then i must come out and link up with the prophet the man of god and make the confession it's gone it's lost my prayer life is not as it used to be and my confidence in god is not as it used to be and the promise i have and the way i held on to the promise of god tenaciously is not as it should to be it is when we confess with conviction it's when we confess with expectation we will have everything that we have lost and i pray this period we are together will be a period of total recovery in your life and in your ministry in jesus name amen Look at number one there is the conversion and the call of recoverers. We're looking at uh, First Kings chapter 19, and we're looking at verse 13. First Kings chapter 19, we're reading from verse 13. It says, and uh, it was so when he saw the fire, he saw the earthquake, and then after that, had a still small voice. A still small voice. And when he heard that still small voice that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and he stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou? Us for the fire you have inside the prophet of fire. Are there not things to burn? What doest thou here, Elijah? With the authority you have to bring rain and to bring the fire, and you are here. No congregation, discouragement, and the fear of Jezebel brought you here. What doest thou here, Elijah? You must ask yourself. The question the Lord is asking you when you are sulking, when you are complaining, when you are in 
intimidated, where you are boxed and pushed into a corner, and you are there, and you are not thinking of ministry, all that God is gone. All Elijah was thinking of is, take me away, kill me. And because they are after my life, don't let no Gentiles, uncircumcised people, kill me. Kill me yourself. Elijah, what are you doing out here? And when we hear that kind of question, or we turn over that kind of question in our heart, why am I here? Why am I in a corner? Why am I running away? Why am I shielding myself? Don't you forget the fire in your life before? Don't you forget? Have you forgotten how you confronted all those prophets of hell all alone by yourself? Elijah, what doest thou here? And then in verse 16, verse 16 tells us, And Jehu the son of Nimshai, Shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel? And Elisha, God gave Elijah the name of Elisha. Elisha did not have to do political maneuver. He didn't have to do any kind of push and pull. He didn't have to press this button and press this button. He didn't have to be worldly wise to become a prophet that will replace Elijah. The Lord gave Elijah the name of Elisha. Elisha, the son of Shem, of the shepherd uh, of Abel Mahura. He even told him where the man was living. You will anoint him to be prophet in thy room. Anyone who is going to be prophet in the room, in the room, in the stead of Elijah, will need to have real compassion and divine call from heaven. And in verse 19, in verse 19 it says, So he departed thence and found Elisha. Of course, he went to the place the Lord had told him, If you go to the wrong place, you will not find the person God spoke to you about. He said, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelve, and Elijah passed by and cast his mantle upon him. They had never met, and yet you must be able to interpret the message of your call. If you are not able to interpret, say what kind of strange man is this that just saw me after I've seen him for the first time and then he threw his mantle on me, you must be able to interpret the message of your call. And then it says in verse 20, in verse 20 it says, and he led the oxen, there's something to leave, there's a bridge behind to burn. There is something that is less important. How many flowers, how many farmers are there in the land? We don't have their names, but we have the name of the one that counted the ministry and the calling higher than the oxen and the blind. And he led the oxen and he ran after Elijah. There was something in the heart. There was desire. There was fire in his heart. And he ran. He ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again. For what have I done to thee? The people who are going to be used of God must understand the language that may mean discouragement for other people. Elijah said, what have I done to you? Are you going to follow me? And yet the Lord had given the name of Elijah to Elijah. Go back again. And then we're told in verse 21, in verse 21, it says, 
Jesus and you returned back to, from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and in the age and then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him and ministered unto him he had the call he had the commitment he had the conversion he was no more there on the farm he was now in the ministry with Elijah and look at what he did in chapter 3 of 2nd Kings verse 11 2nd Kings chapter 3 verse 11 but Joshua said is there not a prophet here a prophet here of the Lord that we may ask inquire demand of the Lord by him and one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said here is Elisha. Elijah is gone. It's chapter 3. Elijah already went to heaven in chapter 2. Here is Elisha, the son of Shepherd, which poured water on the hand. I pour water on his side for a purpose, and I am made and destined to be a prophet. But this is the beginning. Always think about your own calling. Always think about what God is giving you to do now. If you are pouring water on somebody's hands, do it with all your heart, with all your soul. Whatsoever your heart finds to do, don't belittle all that. Don't uh, kind of relegate that to the background. Is this what I'm going to be doing? When is this man going? And when am I going to take over? Elijah, Elisha did not discuss all about that. In Matthew chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 28, the words of Jesus come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then in verse 28, it says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn. Observe. Learn. Reach. Learn. They dedicate yourself. Learn. In everything and every day and every situation, learn. And what you learn, then you'll be able to do. And it says, for I am meek and lowly and in heart and ye shall find rest unto your soul in verse uh, 30 it says for my yoke is easy there's still a yoke and Elisha understood yoke he yoked those animals together so that they can plow so that they can pull and so that they can cultivate and when we are yoked to the Lord and also yoked to colleagues and others in ministry we are able to plow, we are able to push, we are able to pull, and we are able to grow the kingdom the way he wants each grown for my 
yoke is easy and my burden is like we'll come to number two here number two we're looking at the commission and the consecration of restorers commission restoration of restorers in first kings chapter 19 verse 16 and give with the son of Nimshai shall thou anoint to be king over Israel and Elisha the son of Shephat of Ebel Mehola shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy that's the description of his commission to come instead of you. You would have gone, and everything you had been doing, this man Elisha will do. Confronting kings, preaching the word, challenging the nation. Why all true between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. If Baal, serve him. Everything Elijah had been doing, raising up the glory of God, lifting up the glory of God, and calling the people to give allegiance to the God of heaven, their creator and their redeemer. Everything Elijah had been doing, he, Elisha, will be prophet in the room, in the place, instead of Elijah. We must understand a commission. If um, Elijah were here in this situation, what would he do? He will pray. He will preach. He will prophesy. He will challenge the people. He will bring them back to God. He will not cringe. He will not cower. He will not be timid. He will proclaim the mind of the Lord unto the people. Elijah will a prophet in your place, in your room. That's the calling in heart. And that's the calling we have to understand. We have. We come to restore the glory of God. We come to restore allegiance to God. We come to restore the commitment of individuals, of families, of nations, of the nation of nations. We come to restore them unto God. We come to restore the people who have gone away from God and back from God. They are backsliding. We watch with presence of mind with the power and the purpose in our mind and with the pursuit for the glory of God we need to recall the people back unto the Lord we're looking at Isaiah chapter 58 and we're reading from verse 11 Isaiah 58 verse 11 and the Lord shall guide thee continually the Lord will guide thee continually and you know sometimes we we're here in Samaria and we're successful and there is an Ethiopian eunuch in the desert and then the Lord will guide you uh, continually leave that place there is the assignment here you're touching the life of a man that will take the fullness of the gospel to Ethiopia leave that place and come here and we know it's the guidance of the Lord what am I going to do and what's the commission I have? What's the calling I have? That's why the Lord says, guide you. And satisfy thy soul in truth. And make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden. Better amen. There are times we feel we dry. And it's like we're not we're thirsty for something. We don't know what it is for. And in our thirst, in our weariness, we're confused. What are we going to do? The commission includes that the Lord, when you're weary, when you're dreary, when it appears everything is dried up, He will refresh you. And when you are refreshed, your mind is refreshed, your brain is refreshed, and your vision refresh. I'm sure you use uh, this, uh, this of us that use a tablet. And you try to get a program out of that tablet. It's like it's not coming up. And then eventually you get a sign there that says, refresh that tablet. Put it up. Turn it on. 
and when it's refreshed, all the uh, programs are vanishing, and all the programs you cannot see or read or discover, lo and behold, everything comes up in sharp focus. We need to refresh our lives. We need to refresh our vision. We need to refresh everything the Lord has given us. And it says we'll be like a water garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Your life will not fail. Your calling will not fail. Your compassion will not fizzle out in Jesus' name. And then in verse 12, in verse 12 it says, And they that shall be of thee, your converts, your children, your family, and the people you have influence upon, all those that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places in our country in our churches, in our fellowship, and thou shalt raise up a foundation of many generations. That's our calling, that's our commission, and then it says, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in, the restorer, the restorer we we'll be commissioned and we need to be committed and consecrated to that commission the Lord will do it in Jesus name Matthew chapter 17 reading from verse 11 in Matthew 17 verse 11 and Jesus answered and said unto them Elias truly shall first come but Elias is gone Elijah is gone there is an Elisha in his place and restore all things. Restore their faith in God. Restore their faithfulness to God. And restore their submissiveness unto God. Restore their confidence in God. And that was the commission that Elisha came to put in place and for you to the restorer and it says before the lord comes the faith the church has lost when the son of man will come will he find faith on the earth that's what we are restored we are to restore and all the things the word of god the word of salvation of full salvation that's what we are to restore because it's gone many places are coming to number three there number three there is the conviction and the confession of the recovery the conviction and the confession of the recovery and there are things we have lost in our personal lives and then we say i don't think i can get anything and there are things we've lost in our family the lord I was saying there's no use thinking about it. Make me do with whatever remains because we do not have the conviction and we do not have the confession that 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 have been lost in our lives, in our families, as can be recovered in our local church where we minister. We've been there. How for many years have you been in that church? And this is gone. And you only regret the faithfulness you used to see, the conviction you used to see, and the passion you used to realize. The people, the, the people walking, what they will do excitedly, and what they will do with all their heart, all that is gone. But you have the conviction you can recover that, that everything you've lost in the local church, and the commitment you've lost, the, and the service you've lost, the giving you've lost, that everything can come back. We need to have the conviction before we can have the recovery, the conviction, and the confession of the recovery. And in Second Kings chapter 6, reading from verse 5, but as one was failing, he beam, the axe head fell 
into the water and he cried, he cried out, he called out, alas, master, for it was borrowed. Why would he cry out like that? He had the conviction inside him that if Elisha, in the place in the room of Elijah, will call to heaven, there'll be that miracle. And there'll be that recovery. That's the conviction he had. And if you have that conviction that everything lost in your life will come back again. It will come back in Jesus' name. And then we're told in Job chapter 42 verse 2. Job chapter 42 verse 2. I know that's conviction. I know that thou canst do everything. I look at my body and my wife even asks, why are you still expecting because God and that nothing worse that this can ever happen and you look away from that. He had conviction. I know that thou canst do everything. And the disciples of the Lord Peter included, I go a fishing with all that fall, with all that denial. Can I be uh, an apostle again? I know that God can do everything. Uh, and with all the, uh, all the difficulties and all the challenges of the day and of the ministry, can I still fulfill the will of God? I know that thou canst do everything in your life. You can do everything. No matter the level where you are now, no matter at a low value where you are now, you must know, you must have the conviction that the God of heaven, the God of all power, the God of redemption can do all things in your life. I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholding from thee. But looking at uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 27, and he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. The things which are impossible, that man, I thought he would help me, impossible. That woman, I thought he would help, she would help me, impossible. That financier, I thought he'll get me out of the wretch, impossible with me, but let's understand, even though we find it impossible with men, all those things are possible with God. Restoration in your life, revival in your life, recovery in your life, in Jesus' name. Let's come to point number two now. Point number two, uh, we're looking at the link with the miraculous through the ministration of the godly. In 2 Kings chapter 6, reading from verse 3, it says, And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. What if that link, that connection was not there? And he went without Elisha. And the accent fell into the water, into the river. What should they have done? The link with the miraculous is very important. The connection with the one that had the mantle of Elijah is very important. Then in verse 4, in verse 4 it says, So he went with them. So he went with them. You know, Elisha might have said, was the don't have better things to do. They are going to court to go. That's not my ministry. That's not, you know, my calling. But you wait for them. Never despise any opportunity that shows up. Even though you are asking yourself, what's with that going to mean? What is that going to achieve? So he went for them. And when they came to Jordan, they caught down the wood. The link with the miracle through the ministration of the godly. We're looking at uh, three things here. Number one is the petition for companionship with the master. The connection that they 
ought to have. And he made petition, please, be pleased to go with us. Number two, in the power of the cross for miracles. Number three, in the possibilities of Christ in me. The possibilities of Christ by me. The possibilities of Christ through me. The possibilities of Christ in, by, and through me. Look at number one. Number one, the petition for companionship with the master. Already you heard the petition, the request, be pleased to go with us. I was told in we told in John chapter 15, reading from verse 4. John chapter 15, reading from verse 4. Abide in me. That's our master talking. That's the Messiah talking. That's Christ, our Lord and Savior talking. Abide in me and I in you. The connection must be there. The link must be there as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. For us to bear fruit, for us to fulfill the purpose of our calling, abiding in him as Savior, abiding in him as sanctifier, abiding in him, him as the baptizer in the Holy Ghost, abiding in him as our master who is always in control. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abides in the vine, no more can you. Whatever your talent, no more can you. Whatever your expertise, no more. No, uh, it says, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me. The connection must always be there. Are you going to pray for people? The connection must be with the Lord. Are you going to counsel people? The connection must be there. Are you envisaging to solve a problem and to discover what is the missing link? Why this thing has not been working? The link must be there. The connection must be there. He that abideth in me and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit, but without me ye can do nothing. Nothing rewarded, nothing supernatural, nothing here that has the approval of heaven. But without me ye can do nothing. We're looking at number two there. Number two, we're looking at the power of the cross for miracles. The power of the cross for miracles. See what Elisha did in Second Kings chapter six, verse eight. And the man of God said, "Where fell it?" And he showed him the place, and he cut down his stick and cast it thither, and the iron. Please understand, whatever things are written in the scriptures of the Old Testament, they are written for our learning, for whom the ends of the world are come. That through those scriptures of the Old Testament, we might have hope following the Lord with all the patience. He cut down his teeth and he threw it in. It's picturing the cross, the tree on which Christ will die. In the Old Testament, you have uh, many illustrative prophecies like that. I come to Exodus. In Exodus chapter 15, we're looking at verse 23. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. Now, life Water, 
greater journey, greater, and their way out of Egypt, now in the wilderness, going to the promised land, everything greater. What was the leader to do? But looking at verse 25, in verse 25, and he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And the Lord showed him a tree. The water was bitter. Oh Lord, how can the water become sweet? And he showed him a tree, a which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. That tree at Calvary, that cross at Calvary, on which my Savior died, on which your Savior died, emphasize it in your life. Whatever is bitter in your life will become sweet in Jesus' name. You cannot make it sweet by yourself. You cannot sweeten all those bitter experiences by yourself, whatever those experiences are. But when you look to the tree on which he died for you, cast it in, into your situation, <clears throat> everything will become sweet in Jesus' name. And there he made for them his statue. There, when the tree switching the bitter water, he made for them a statute and an ordinance. And there he proved them. What was the ordinance he made for them? Verse 26. In verse 26, six, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will not, I will put none of these of these diseases upon thee. I thought I'll get a good evening. Which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Amen. Because of that tree, because of the tree that was caught and put into that bitter water, everything becomes, look at the interpretation in the New Testament, we're looking at First Peter chapter 2, we're reading from verse 24, First Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who is so self, bear our bear in his own body on the tree, on the tree, who his own cell bear our sins in his own body on the tree. And then it says, and should that now we've been dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. Tell me the rest by whose stripes ye of that tree on which he died. And he tied him to the post, still a tree, part of a tree, and whipped him, and by those stripes you are healed in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three is the possibilities of Christ in me. The possibilities of Christ by me. The possibilities of Christ through me. We're looking at John chapter 14, verse 10. John 14, verse 10. Believest thou that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Don't you believe here I am, my Father in heaven, and yet the Father works in me? And then I dwell in the Father. Why was he saying that? He was going to say, you believe in me and I in you. That's why he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in unto him. I in you. Christ 
in you. The hope of glory, the hope of all possibilities in our lives. And Jesus said, you know how I do the work I do, how I perform the miracles I perform, connection with the Father dwelling in the Father and the Father dwelling in me believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me the words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself but the Father that dwelleth in me I speak the word I give the command I tell them rise and walk I tell them, be made whole. I tell them, your sins which are many are forgiven. I tell the storm, peace be still. But you understand, the Father that dwelleth in me, he from within me doeth the works. It's to tell us that as he dwells in us, our Christ, the miracle worker, our Savior, our Redeemer, the one that makes all things possible, he dwells in me, the believer. And I, the believer, I dwell in him. And because of that, everything I do, I do by the command and the control and the conviction of the Christ that dwells in me. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father. He says that the secret of the success of his ministry and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake which the Father does in me. Then in verse 12, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also how because the one that actually does the work lives in me because he lives in you and therefore sees his still the same yesterday today and forever and he dwells in you alive in you active in you he says the works that i do he shall also do and greater works than they shall he do does that mean that i human, I, believer, I, just a follower of Jesus, I can go beyond Christ, uh -huh. Christ dwells in you, and because Christ dwells in you, the work that is done is not only you, it's not just you, it's the Christ that lives in you that does it, and he is the one living in you, abiding in you, that does the greater works, that's why it says, greater works than thee shall be do because I go unto my Father. And he tells us in verse 13, he says, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. He is the one doing it. He lives in you, abides in you. He says, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Verse 14, in verse 14, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. In the one that lives and abides in you, that actually does that. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. As the Father lived in the Son, and every work that the Son did, it was done by the Father that dwelt in him. The same thing we believe us now, and we ministers now, it's not we doing the work, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He'll walk through you. I said he'll walk through you. 
and he will accomplish everything everything he could have done he should have done if we were if he were here on earth he will still do but now he closes through you because he abides in you in first john chapter 4 verse 4 first john chapter 4 verse 4 ye of god little children and have overcome them all those challenges, all those difficulties, all those Satan-inspired actions, how can I overcome them? Because greater, you see, that is in you. Is that one in us that actually overcomes on our behalf? And then it appears we are the one overcoming, it's the one that gives us the watch, the sword, the power, the weapon, makes us overcome because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world and in Mark chapter 9 verse 23 Jesus said unto him if thou canst believe if you can believe that I dwell in you if you can believe that I minister in you if you can believe that I'm the one the power that is in you that puts you over. If you can believe that what I did before in the world, I now abide in you and I will do it through you. If thou canst believe all things are possible to him that believe it. I come to point number three now. Point number three, learning the mastery by ministers now we're ministers of the gospel in our old life before we came to the lord yes we learned but many of us did not come to mastery in everything in all the things that we learned all the things that we did why when we've done something and it goes beyond 50 percent you see that's good enough what else have been looking for other people got 43 percent other people got 32 percent i got 55 that's good enough and when we were constructing something building something you know, and the thing begins uh, you know to work a little bit we don't think of improvement we say that's good enough that's the reason uh, we couldn't have uh, mastery and in every area of life life is like that we're learning so that we can get something done we're learning so that we can have success and when we compare ourselves with other people and we say i took the fifth position i have the person that took the 50th position i think this is good enough i should always rejoice when there is a little success but no we're going to mastery in ministry in jesus name and you're seeing it every day how to perfect that, how to improve that, how to make that work in such a perfect way that you say you have mastered this art. And that mastery has now showed up in every area of it. But God looks at us, and if He knows that all we want and all we are running after is mastery over everything that we do he'll take us there but we need to learn after 20 years in ministry but you need to learn again learning the mastery after you have succeeded here and there and there what are you learning again learning for mastery don't be satisfied until the promises of the word are fulfilled in your life until the promises of the word are fulfilled in your ministry don't be satisfied until there is no failure in any area of life and ministry you are learning for mastery by the because you are the minister of the gospel there are three things we're looking at here number one the making and the lifestyle of the sons of God. That's where we start. The sons of God, the making and the lifestyle of the sons of God. Number two, the molding and the learning of the servant.
presence of God we cross over the line between the sons and the servants and now we come to be servants of God and the Lord moves us by what we learn, by what we hear, by what we make use of in what we hear, the molding and the learning of the servants of God. Number three, the ministration of love by the stewards of God. The ministration of love, the things we do, the things we put in place, and the things we attempt in the kingdom, helping and preaching and healing and comforting and saving souls, everything will minister out of love. Because we're now still what's up. Look at number one. Number one, the sons of God, the making and the lifestyle of the sons of God in John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. At conversion, we become the sons of God. At repentance and faith in Christ, we become the sons of God. As we receive him, we receive him as a savior. We cannot save ourselves because there is no other name given among men whereby we can be saved except the name of Jesus. And when we do that, he gives us the privilege, he gives us the power, he gives us the potentials of the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We don't believe in feeling. Am I a child of God? Am I not a son of God? I look at my feeling. No, I look at Christ. He died for me. And because he died for me, and I it was for me he died. It was for me he shed his blood. As I believe that, he gives me the privilege and the power and the potentials of the sons of God. In Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 14, it tells us, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. As he lives in me, he abides in me. Because I've taken him as my savior now, he makes his presence in my heart known because he leads me by his spirit. We're looking at Philippians chapter 2, and I'm reading here from verse 14. For it says, I do all things without murmurings and disputings. Verse 15, in verse 15, that she may be blameless and harmless the sons of God. That's the potential he gives me. That's the potential he gives you. As sons of God, he's always present with us, directing us, go this and no, don't go that. Don't say that. Don't do that. And as he leads us into action, he leads us into the path of righteousness. He says, he makes us harmless as sons of God without you in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom we shine as lights in the world. And then he tells us in 1 John chapter 3, reading from verse 1, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Watch what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should call the sons of God. There are sons of God, sons of God. By faith in Christ, what love he has manifested that we should be called the sons of God. Wherefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Number ever said verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when it shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is amen for the life we're coming to number two number two is the molding and the learning of the servants of god after we become the sons of god there's a passion in our heart we want to serve, we want to serve God by serving the body of Christ.
that want to serve in the kingdom by serving the cities is of the kingdom we want to serve we want to be servants and he has to make us learn he has to mold our lives make our lives and fit us for ministry that he has cut out for us we're looking at titus chapter one reading from verse one in titus chapter one verse one paul the servant of god converted servant of god committed servant of god commissioned servant of god consecrated servant of god controlled by the spirit servant of god and filled with grace by grace i am what i am Paul is servant of God. He does all he does. He passes us through everything we pass through and everything we face, everything that comes at us. He uses everything to mold us to be, to become, to remain a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the face of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness and then in verse 2 in verse 2 in hope of eternal life which god that cannot lie promised before the world began look at verse 3 in verse 3 but he has in deep times manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me servant of god the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the saving message is committed unto me according to the commandment of God, our Savior, servant of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're looking at verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace made us the sons of God. And the same grace, abounding grace, abundant grace, molding grace, mentoring grace, made us the servant of God. And it says, and by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored as a servant more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was given, which was with me. Because he has not chosen us to be servants, and everything we ought to do, in every situation we find ourselves in, he gives us, he grants us, he bestows upon us abundant grace that we might be the servant, effective servant of God that he wants us to be. We're told in Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the servant of God. Moses was faithful in all the Lord called him to do as a servant of God. And now in heaven, the sang the son of Moses, the servant of the people who have wandered and they have been bothered about Moses. Because the Lord said they will not get to the physical land of Canaan. And they wondered, did he get to heaven? Of course, he got to heaven number one. God himself buried him and did not allow any of the hands of the Israelites to hold him. A very number two, when God called the Joshua and said, Moses, my servant is dead. Now you arise and lead the people unto the land of Canaan. He was servant of God. And then we're told that Joshua did everything. Moses, the servant of God, told him, God has told his servant Moses what to do. He was servant of God. And now, on the Mount of Transfiguration, here comes Christ, and he was a glistering, uh, more than any worship to have washed the clothes. And we have Elijah, and we have Moses. We build 
three tabernacles, one for Jacob, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Of course, he got to heaven. Now we're told in Revelation, uh, and, it, and they said, and they said, the redeemed of the Lord, the people of God that got to heaven, eventually be seeing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, Christ and Moses now joined together in the song of victory that he sang in heaven of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true. At thy ways, thou King of saints. We're looking at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the ministration of love by the stewards of stewards of God, as we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, reading there from verse 1, that a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and the stewards of the mysteries of God. In verse 2, in verse 2 it says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. As you look at the election, as we're looking at this uh, event today, this story today, the um, axe head had fallen into the water. Alas, my master, because it was borrowed. And Elisha did not say, Why were you careless? Are you not experienced in putting the axe head on you on the wood? Why did you allow that? Now you've done that careless, foolish thing, and your axe head is gone, and you are asking me now to do something about that. No, Elisha did not say that. He loved the servant, and he loved all the sons of the prophets under his control, under his leadership. No criticism, and no complaint, no bad mouth, and no bad comment. Uh, that's what you did, you've done it before. Nothing like that. Love. Whatever we do, we minister in love. We don't condemn the people, they lost their accent. We don't criticize the people, they lost their accent. We don't uh, pounce on them, we don't punish them, they lost their accent. We do something that shows that, in spite of what has happened, we love the people of God. Whatever we do, out of anger, hatred, out of uh, criticism, out of, you know, malice, or wanted to do this and do that. Now they give us a chance to do bad and to do bad things to them. All that will not be rewarded by God. We have to minister in love if we are stewards of God. We're looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're reading from verse 1. I speak with the, with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, and have not love. I have become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. We might be a tinkling cymbal, produce the right sound, and then sounding brass and produce the melodious uh, song or music or whatever, but without love. Without love. There's no life, it is no love, and there is no lifting up if there's no love. You might give somebody food, for example, if there's no love behind it, you want to eat, okay, you're hungry, okay, and then you just put it there. Without charity, without love, it means nothing to you, and nothing in glory, and nothing to be rewarded. It tells us in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, and go, I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, a great teacher, and have all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains of problems from people, it says, I am not charity, I am nothing. The evaluation of heaven, he evaluates us by love. And if we have lost the love, and we're just carrying on the ministry and the techniques of ministry, if we're just carrying on, and the love is, that's the axe head. 
that is falling into the river and was still caught in and caught in but it's no love we're angry against the people of god we're angry even against the sinners when we talk about the smokers and the drunkards we're really angry at them you kill yourself you give yourself lung cancer you give this and that we're angry at the people who are angry and we'll say you know that anger it will increase your blood pressure and all those things you're doing you'll be condemned if and if we're condemning them without bringing them in love out of the uh, condemnation of the ministry is nothing we might even appear to move mountains mountains of sicknesses and whatever but we have animosity and hatred and bitterness against people it says i uh, now look at verse 3 in verse 3 he tells us and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor so we can brag we look, we know, how much money I give out how much I help that family I help that family I'm the one that is making them to survive without me they would have died without me this and that and if they do anything I don't mistakenly or carelessly I would say look at them I'm the one feeding them, I'm the one giving them this and that. There's no love. There's no love. We we'll just go through all the activities of life. What do we the right thing? What do we need? It's good to feed the poor. And it's good to remove mountains. It's good to help people. But the stage of our mind, the stage of our soul, and the feelings we have towards people and the grumbling we have inside us that makes our ministry useless and if we have lost that axe head of love we need to pray oh lord help me i want to help with a free mind i want to heal with a free mind i want to do the work of the kingdom with the right state of mind because though i bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though i give my body to be born to be born that zeal that's passion a person that says i don't care let those pursuitors come and burn me alive i want to be like here that we shall can have been even if we did that without love it means nothing in the kingdom of god it says do i give my body to be born and have not charity, love, it profiteth me nothing. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, And now abideth hope, faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and charity, love. These three for the greatest of these is charity, is love. I pray that everything we have lost that fell into the water of this life into the water of struggling that you know we do not have the accent of the power of the faith of the passion of the desire that life to preach the gospel and help people come out of sin and come to the Lord I pray that all the accent we have lost today the Lord will restore and then you get that to when the power of the Lord was active and vibrant in your life, when you moved in the love of God, when somebody doesn't have to push you or pull you or drag you, but you have that love, you are just happy to do the work of God and the results are coming more than ever before. Greater results in your life in Jesus' name. You can do it today. He will do it to you. And whatever you ask, He will do. He puts you there to succeed. You will not fail. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and recover whatever acts age you have lost, whatever effectiveness you have lost, whatever power, whatever zeal, whatever passion, and whatever essential thing we have lost for success in ministry, the Lord is ready to give up. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, here am I, here am I, here am I. You called me and you will effect every good thing in me so 
that you will give me the success I need. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord. Ask the edge recovered. The ministry recoverable. Your passion. Everything you need. Recoverable. Tell the Lord. He has you in focus. He has you in mind. Lost acts heads have been 